This is our second video in the evolution unit uh, for IV Biology. This is 5.1 for IV Bio and for the 2016 exam material. And if you haven't already watched the previous video on natural selection, I would suggest maybe watching that before getting into evidence for evolution and evolution in general, uh, as natural selection is the driving force with, for what causes biological evolution, and so probably be best to start with that first. But as a review from that video, Biological evolution is the cumulative change in the allele frequencies of heritable characteristics of a population. And basically what that means is that it's uh, a change in the frequencies of different alleles or different expressions or types of traits within a population uh, in which those traits can be passed on and inherited. And so this all is dependent on the idea that there's descent with modification, meaning that parents pass on to offspring their traits and through their genes and there's variation within those offspring. They're not all going to look the same, and those that are um, best able to survive and reproduce or best fit within the population are going to actually do so, and those that are not perish and are not able to, to reproduce and have reproducing offspring. And so over a long period of time, we can see generally in a population, uh, rather than an individual, we can see that population change over time. And all of this is dependent on different selection pressures. And in the natural selection video, we took a look at excuse me, uh, that this is dependent on variation over production of offspring and change in environmental conditions, some sort of change in order to induce different selective pressures. And so then we had this graphic that kind of outlined and showed how all of these things contribute to natural selection. And natural selection is the driving force for biological evolution. Developed by Charles Darwin, came up with the idea by analyzing the data he collected in his famous Galapagos voyage and looking at bird beaks and various other organisms that he studied, identifying and seeing that species change given their, their habitats, their environments, where they're living. And that can change over time uh, depending on how the environment will change. And so in this video, we're going to more specifically look at some of the different ways that this actually happens and then also some evidence for biological evolution, how we know that this is actually happening. And one of the first pieces of evidence that we can draw to is looking at fossils. And fossils provide a record of life on Earth, the history of life on the Earth. And through a number of advances, we can actually determine the age of fossils. Um, this would be carbon or radiometric dating. And we can use these techniques in order to be able to find an approximate age of different fossils or rock layers in order to as better, uh, better be able to understand how old something is. Um, and so what we would expect to see in terms of biological evolution is a sequence in which the fossils um, appear in the fossil record, so they're present in the fossil record, in a sequence or an order in which they would expect it to, to have evolved. Um, and so a good example of this is actually looking at um, the present day horse species and comparing it to that to species closely related and uh, but no longer present. And so this diagram here shows uh, the outline of, of how this uh, related species evolved over time. And you'll notice that there's not a straight linear path, whereas this organism did not directly become the present modern day horse. There's a lot of other branches off of this, and these are all representing different species, some of which most of which are no longer present, have all died or gone extinct at some point in time. Um, but what this image does show is over time how these different species have adapted to their specific environments to help them to be able to survive, leading to what we see today. And if we were to look at this, the fossil record, we would, expect, um, we would expect this progression based off of these environmental changes to, to be present. And so what this can show us is the similarities and differences, and it indicates the relatedness of present day and extinct organisms. And it can also indicate the formation of new species by comparing modern day fossils or, or bone structures to fossils um, uh, that have been discovered uh, of previous organisms, whether they're the same species or different. Um, and so multiple sequences oftentimes link together existing organisms with likely ancestors. If we go back here, we follow this, we can see ancestors, and so here would be an ancestor, and there's uh, multiple branching points. And so we can turn to the fossil record to help us, help us build an understanding of how species have changed over time and how they're related. And this provides evidence, again, because the sequence of, of how these organisms appear in the fossil record is what we would expect in terms of the, uh, the, the progression or the sequence of, of organisms evolving.
A second piece of evidence, and, and really one that is, really makes sense, is the process of selective breeding. Uh, and this is something that is done by humans. For hundreds of years, we have purposely bred species. Dogs are a great example. Um, we, have, we have tailored species by select, this process of selective breeding to be able to have the most desired traits that we want. And so if you think about this, uh, modern day dogs are actually, their ancestor is the gray wolf. And there's lots of information about how this process occurred, but essentially by giving food to wolves that were a little less aggressive and a little less afraid of humans, over time, humans were able to domesticate the dogs by allowing those that had traits that they wanted, starting with being friendly and less aggressive to humans, by breeding those dogs and their offspring and doing that process over and over and over again, it led to wolves that were less and less afraid of humans and more sociable and more protective of humans and allowed the modern day dog species to eventually be developed. And all of that is possible because of selective breeding. Uh, another great example of this is seen in corn and other crops. For hundreds of years, humans have been selectively breeding corn to produce corn today that is much larger. If you think about this in the same regards as the dogs, if you have a number of different ears of corn, you're going to reproduce or, or plant the, the, the seeds uh, for the next crop of whichever corn kernel you, you think is best. So maybe the best color or the best size or the best flavor. By taking all of those and then breeding, selecting one and breeding that one for the next generation and then doing that process multiple times can produce um, crops or, or animals, in the case of dogs, that have the most desirable traits. And we can actually see this, these populations changing. We can see, uh, nowadays we can look at the DNA of wolves and dogs, we can look at the, the DNA of crops and compare them, and we can see how these species have changed, their allele frequencies have changed over time because of a selective pressure. And in this case, the selective pressure is humans. Uh, a third piece of evidence is looking at homologous and analogous structures. Many organisms share structural similarities. If you look at bone structures, um, of a human, dog, bird, and whale, the bones and their colors here are representing the same bones. And so in homologous structures, they are similar in structure, so these bones are all similar in structure, position and development, and that is because they are due to a common ancestor. So all of these species here, at one point or another, have a common ancestor. They may not be used in the same particular function, but they are similar in structure. The opposite of that is analogous structures. And these are structures that are similar in function, but different in structural arrangement. Uh, and this would be an example of the insect wing or a bird wing uh, in, in comparison of those two. Human arm, bird arm, same bone structure here, homologous structures, insect wing, bird wing. No similar bone structures. Insects don't even have bones. And so they're analogous structures. What this tells us is that both the bird and the insect faced similar selective pressures in which being able to fly or glide, maybe to start, provided an evolutionary advantage, uh, uh, increased their fitness, and allowed them to be able to survive. And so homologous and analogous structures can, can, be, can be compared uh, for different species and help us to gain an understanding of ancestor and also provide a, a way to, to compare these species to see, um, to see how biological evolution is actually occurring, whether things are related to one another or just due to selective pressures. And so one way that we can see species change over time is through a process of adaptive radiation. And in this case, there is a common ancestor and multiple other species that are related to this ancestor that have this, this, this share a common ancestor. And all of these different species are, are developed because of different environmental changes or conditions. And so in this case, we're looking at an image that shows different birds. And all of these birds are finch or tar types of finches. And they all have slightly different beaks because of the different foods or environments that they live in. What this leads to is similarities of homologous structures due to common ancestry. So all of these birds here, going back a slide, all of these birds share a common ancestor, and so they are going to have homologous structures because they share a common ancestor. Now, looking at this a little bit further, we have the topics of convergent versus divergent evolution. And so in this graph, we've, we've got a good way to illustrate this. Um, in A, over the period of time, a parent species splits into two different species. In B, 
We have two different parent species and they come closer together. And in C, we have two parent species and they're just parallel. Co convergent evolution is the independent evolution of similar features in different species due to similar environments or selective pressures. And so in this case, that is going to represent B. And that is an example of what could lead to an analogous structure in which there's similar structures due to different um, or similar, uh, similar selective pressures since we have these similar structures. Divergent evolution is the opposite, and that's the gradual evolution of different features in two different species who share a common ancestor due to different environments. And this gives rise to homologous structures, and it is also an example of adaptive radiation. A real-life example of the convergent evolution is the comparison of sugar gliders in Australia and the flying squirrel in North America. Um, both of these organisms have similar selective pressures in which being able to glide amongst the treetops helps them to be able to survive. But they don't share a parent species. They don't share a common ancestor. And so through this selective pressure, they have both adapted to their environment and they have these webbed skin structures in between their, their limbs that allow them to glide or essentially fly. And so this would be an example of convergent evolution where similar selective pressures has led to similar, um, similar structural features. Homologous structures then obviously lead to divergent evolution as, as we just talked about. So here are some uh, definitions for these two uh, if you would like to, to write those down for your notes. Um, and again, another, another graph here to represent. The next topic that we want to talk about is something called transient polymorphism. And this is um, a process that produces two or more clearly different phenotypes within, a, within the population. Um, and so the word transient means changing or lasting only for a short time. And so transient polymorphism is a change, and it could be a gradual change from one phenotype to another. So it's the process of changing from one phenotype to another. Um, and so there's a real life example of this that you've probably heard of or seen before, and that is the, the melanistic moth uh, during the Industrial Revolution. Um, this moth species flies at night uh, to be able to find mates and reproduce and hide on branches uh, during the day. So it's active at nighttime. Uh, and, and the moths are prey to birds and other day predators, and so being able to blend into its environment during the day is really important. The tree branches originally uh, in England um, uh, were covered by lichen, and so they, they had this light kind of color. You've maybe seen these before. Um, kind of this light color, kind of a white grayish color. And so the, the moths also had a very similar color to be able to blend into the to the background, uh, to the trees. And so in 1848, the light moths had a, a huge advantage over the dark moths because the dark moths would obviously stand out and be a little bit easier to see and then would be eaten. And so through collectives, collections and analysis of this, uh, found that 99% of the moths were this light color. Well, as the Industrial Revolution occurred over the next couple of decades, um, the factories producing products started to use coal to be able to, to produce electricity and to be able to power the machines and in burning coal produce soot and all that soot landed on the trees which changed the tree background color from light to dark. That's an environmental change in which the light moths now were less fit. They had less chance of being able to survive and reproduce and pass on their genes whereas the dark moths had the, the better chance of surviving. And so then over a short period of time the population changed so that it was predominantly dark moths. As the Industrial Revolution concluded and ended, and that soot began to be cleaned up, and by the 1990s, being back to the original colors, light moths have a selective, uh, a, an advantage because they blend in, because there's no soot on the trees, and so then we're back to how we started. This is an example of transient polymorphism, these melanistic moths, that changed during the Industrial Revolution because the population is changing over a period of time. And here's an actual picture um, we can see of, of these different moths on the tree trunks. Here's another one as well. You can see the dark very easily, and the light moth is very difficult to be able to see. And this is also an example of, of something what we call directional selection, which we'll get into a little bit more in future videos. Here's the light moths, Industrial Revolution. And so that wraps up our discussion of evidence for evolution. Um, there's lots of other ways that we've seen this occur in populations that we'll discuss in class and in future videos.